And for the gift of this time, Lord, the time is really about those precious gifts that you give us. And so I thank you for uh, these men and women who are choosing to use this part of the time here to, uh, to really be about uh, just, just helping us to get, get more informed and on board with the mission of our church. And uh, pray that it would be a productive time in that vein, uh, that you would be greatly glorified, and that we would be built up in you as a result of being together tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, well, um, anything we want to talk about, you know, it's talking about mission and vision. We've got to say, well, what, what is our, our mission? Well, our mission, actually, what is the mission? The mission of East Main Church is to honor, honor God by making more disciples for Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, and, and that's a, you know, why is that a worthy mission? Uh, I mean, besides that Jesus said that something we ought to do, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that should be reason enough. Um, but also, I mean, if we think about it, as we look around us, we realize there are a lot of people around us who are not yet uh, followers of Jesus Christ, who are not yet disciples. And so if our mission is to make more, it's because there are people around who are not yet followers of Christ. Um, so something that, uh, you know, as we, we study this, we kind of uncovered. Um, we've been throwing this, this out to people. Um, people my age or older typically are like, really? There's that many people that, in this community that aren't really connected to the church? Um, but people younger than I am also say, oh yeah, oh, it's only that much, you know? And that's because, you know, if, if younger people, it, it tends to affect even more. Younger people are less involved with churches. And also, I don't know if you remember this, we've talked about um, just the demographics of our community. Uh, now the borough, the, the township's probably skews a little bit older. Remember what the median age in our borough is? 26.1 <laughs> years old, which would be about, uh, Let's see, median in the U.S. is 37, median in Pennsylvania is 41. So the borough is very young, okay? And again, if you just kind of walk around, walk, walk out there, walk into the Walmart grocery store, you, you kind of, you catch, you catch some of the, the whys and wherefores of that. Um, but, but who are some of these people? I mean, who are some of these people that are, are functionally not, not part of the church? And by the way, if you're not part of the church, or some people not part of the church, maybe they're followers of Christ. Um, there are probably plenty of people who are part of churches who aren't yet followers of Christ, right? So, um, but, but, but who are these people? What are they like? Actually, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you, I'll just take 60 seconds just around your table and, and, and say, you know, do you know people, neighbors, people you work with, people around you who are not connected to any church, who don't seem to be followers of Christ? And if so, just say a little bit something of, of just, don't say names, but what are these people like? Okay, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Around your table. All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. So again, you think of people in our community who are like, we call it functionally unchurched. Um, what, I mean, are these people who are, are they kind of down and out, their lives a mess and all this? Well, for some, maybe. Um, for some of them, though, it might be the happy-go-lucky person who lives next door that, you know, they, they go to work all the week, they, they come back on weekends, they play golf, they watch the Steelers, they see you going off to church, and they think, well, that's nice, that's your thing, it's just not my thing, you know. Um, also in here, we're, we're including a lot of folks who technically now we would call de-churched, okay? These are people who maybe they grew up in the faith, uh, you know, were once maybe even professed faith, uh, but, but for at least, say, five years, which has not at all been involved in church, don't read the Bible. Only times they really talk about, you know, Jesus or God is like they're swearing, right? Um, and this would include, you know, people, probably more people that you can think of. Um, I think of people in my family, okay? So, um, so we're including all these kind of folks. And, and the big issue is how can we become a church that just increasingly helps folks like this to, 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 to really get it when it comes to the gospel and begin following Jesus with us. How can we be a church that helps that, that to happen for people? And one thing that we must do if we're going to be a church that, where that kind of thing can happen among us is that we have to own that as a real objective of ours. This is something we really want to pursue, that we really want to seek to help more people become disciples of Jesus. And that doesn't mean that we're not also seeking to take care of one another and help people who are already followers of Jesus to grow. We're going to naturally do that. Um, that's, that's like gravity. We will always fall back to that. 
But if we're going to be about also trying to reach people who aren't yet disciples, that's something that's going to take some real intentional energy and effort to be about. We've got to really own that. And part of owning that means making decisions with that in mind, including, including decisions about staffing, how we do staff. And that's one of the big issues that I wanted to, to really talk about with you guys tonight, is how we do that. Um, Whoa. For a lot of you, probably one of the, the, the biggest things you catch about, one of the biggest changes that you at least feel, is a change in people, staff people. Uh, it seemed like for a while, every week, we're introducing a new staff person here. Here's a couple of them, some pictures that Eric, who's come in uh, this, this past August, uh, Jacqueline, Luke, Corey's been around a little bit longer, but she's also new in this past year. And then there's some others as well. Uh, this year, we have seven people who this time last year were not under staff who are. In addition to those you saw a picture, uh, Steve Gould, our director of operations, Darren Morton is now our Sunday tech person, and Kim Peterson is a part-time uh, custodian among us as well. So a lot of new, new folks there. Now, among those, though, you'll note only two of them are really new to our church. But still, for everybody here, it's new, new roles, new getting used to things. And also, Melissa Daniels, who's not new uh, to our staff either, has a new role uh, that's a little bit, bit different uh, this year as well. Um, and if I had to summarize, here, here's a summary of how this is different from last year. Here's one way you could look at it. Um, you know, see full-time people, part-time, but like a lot of part-time, like almost half-time or more, and then part-time, half-time or less. This is just the numbers of people we had this time last year versus this year, okay? Um, fewer full-time, more, significantly more half-time and up people, and about the same, one fewer in the, in the less than half-time, part-time. So that's one way to look at, um, at the differences from last time. Um, and by the way, on the other side of the page, of the, the pumpkin color page, you can see a list of all of our current, current staff folks, okay? Um, Budget-wise, our new staff configuration on the right is actually comes out to be a little bit less money than on the left than we were paying last year, although it, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison because of a number of things. For one, we have some unique expenses this year uh, to people transitioning, severances, moving costs, things like that. Um, also, while we did eliminate one full-time staff position, um, our, our financial controller, we had to add some money to the trustees budget to pay for that work. Okay, we didn't add nearly as much as we took away, but still there was a, an addition there in another area. Um, but still, it's uh, like I said, it's, it's a little bit slightly less in 2018, a couple thousand less than 2017. Um, and the why of these changes, um, some people would link this why, oh, that's because you know, that, that consultant group came, that, that, that mean guy Paul Borden came, and he made us do this. It actually really predates Paul. Um, about, Paul came in, in September. In June last year, a, an in-house group uh, reported the session about its recommendations for what our optimal staff would be in terms of fulfilling our mission. Um, and, and what they came up with was not exactly what we're doing now, but is really pretty close to what we're doing now. Um, and the basic principle that that group was working with was how can we put more of our staff dollars toward ministries that are more directly related to making disciples, that are really at the front lines of doing it? How can we do that? That was kind of the principle that they were operating under. And I really do believe that that's been, been fulfilled well with what we're doing now. Here's, to me, the real key difference from last year. <coughs> Fewer hours and dollars going toward office and custodial staff, more going toward children's and youth ministry, worship services, and communication of our ministry, okay? That's, that's to me, the biggest difference in, in how we're doing staff from what we were doing before. And by the way, that's not to say that, you know, that, that, that office and custodial stuff is unimportant. It is important. Um, but our goal, again, is to be as lean and mean as possible in those areas so we can devote as many dollars as possible um, to things that, and as many hours and people as possible, um, to things like children's ministry, worship, communicating our ministry. So that's, um, that, that's in a nutshell 
um, what we've done. And again, that, that's meant taking a hard look, for example, at, as we did this past year, at, okay, we had two full-time office positions, full-time at 32 hours a week, six weeks paid time off, full health benefits and all that. Is there a way that we can do that differently and, and give some more oomph to things like children's youth ministry, worship service, and communication? So it's meant decisions like that. Um, well, in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of what's going on with staff. But at this point, I want us to hear a little bit from uh, our two other full-time pastoral staff members, Melissa, who is not, not, uh, not new, but her position is new, um, and then Eric, who's both new and has a new position that we've never had here before. And I just wanted them to tell us a little bit about you know, what their jobs are and, and how those things are related to our, our mission of making disciples for Jesus. So, Melissa. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so as you know, um, in August, I transitioned from being the director for youth ministries here into the position of assistant pastor for children, youth, and family ministries. And of your handouts today, you got a sheet that looks like this. Um, and I've kind of kind of used this as a basis for um, conversation just I'm a visual thinker, so if that if pictures help you, then maybe this will be helpful for you too. Um, this position is new. We've had a long tradition of having um, a children's ministry director and a youth ministry director, um, and those have been really good, strong ministry areas. Over the past few years, what we found is that there are lots of ideas and um, things that we wanted to do to try and integrate or grow those ministries, but as they were, they were so program driven that the extra time, the energy, um, basically people resources to kind of do the next step, to grow the next piece, to connect more intentionally with families, to develop a scope and sequence, to integrate weekly program programs with our Sunday programs, um, we weren't able to do that really well. So we had these two wheels kind of going, they were functioning really well, um, but we needed that connecting piece in the middle. And so um, in this new position that I have as the assistant pastor for children, youth, and family ministries, we're going to keep our youth ministries going, we're keeping our children's ministries going, and part of my role is to figure out ways that we can integrate and strengthen those ministries so they're not just ministering to children, but they're going to become a way that we can integrate families into the life of our church. Um, I explained it a few weeks ago in church kind of this way that um, when, before Jacqueline had the position, when I was in the position of the directors for youth ministry, it was like I had two hands in youth ministry and Amy Biddle had two hands in children's ministry and there wasn't a hand to connect them. And so now we have Luke, who has two hands full in, invested in youth ministry and we have Jacqueline, two hands in children's ministry and I get to connect them both and help them communicate um, about what's going on there, but also create some energy and a new space or how we can connect more intentionally with the families of our children and youth. I put here a little bit about the primary responsibilities that Luke and Jacqueline will continue to have in their roles there, um, and then a little bit about family ministry, um, which there's lots of different definitions. I thought this one was helpful. Um, is the church and family partnering together to lead children and youth to follow Jesus. Um, and so how we can do that, some different things that we're going to be looking to doing that I'll be working on leading people to do um, is creating a comprehensive and holistic faith formation plan and process. We're going to be, be beginning that with conversation with teachers and leaders from our church to explore uh, a good curriculum that we can integrate not just on Sunday mornings, but how we can engage families with that curriculum. Um, and so that, that we have a very intentional approach that is unified across our ministries. We're looking to coordinate and um, help other ministries cooperate in terms of overlap. So how can we um, more intentionally with children's and youth ministries partner with the missions committee on what they're doing in terms of service opportunities? How can we integrate families 
into um, worship opportunities here. How can we use Youth Club when it starts in the spring again? How can we use that as a springboard for inviting new families in and getting people connected right before the Easter season and integrating them in that way? So that's part of what I'll be working on in terms of um, the macro level of ministry, thinking about how do we leverage what we're doing well already, where are the gaps that we need to um, address, and how can we use those to be channeling not just children but their families and connecting them here at our church. We also want to be doing that through worship, shared service experiences, we're really trying to grow small groups, not just at the adult level, but also with children and youth at our church, um, and also continuing to provide pastoral care and support um, to families so that they kind of feel that they have um, a broader resource here for that as well. Um, so that's a kind of overview of how my role is developing as we go through this process and also um, just some things that we're doing. I'm working with Jacqueline and Luke closely um, for those ministries, but stepping back a little bit from taking direct leadership. So for example, um, Luke and I are leading together the fifth and sixth grade after school program, but he's taking primary responsibility for planning the activities, leading the Bible study. I'm there helping to build those connections and I'll have a piece of that with the Christmas play, but it's shared responsibilities, which frees me up to have time to invest in some of these other things. Jacqueline's taking a primary role in working on recruiting teachers, developing curriculum, communicating with teachers and parents about the Sunday morning program. But I get to be there, jump in, plug in, support them as they're doing that, make sure things are running well, but it frees me up to have more time to invest in some of these other um, aspects as well. Um, all of that too, um, there's another piece of paper that I handed out to you. and. In terms of what I mentioned about a comprehensive holistic faith formation plan and process, um, we're still working on that, and that's a long mouthful of words, but what we're trying to do is create a program that's engaging, if we want to use this acronym, head, hearts, and hands. So we want to be engaging children both emotionally and spiritually, intellectually and physically in the faith formation process. Um, we don't want it to just be focused on intellect, we don't want it to just be emotion driven, um, and we don't want it to just be activities. We want to have a good balance that helps develop the whole person um, as a disciple of Jesus. And so um, this is just a little bit more of kind of where we're going with that. Um, as our mission statement is, we want to be making disciples for Jesus Christ. And um, in our children, youth, and family ministry team, our vision is to partner with parents to engage children and teens in holistic faith formation experiences that will help them grow in a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And our goal is for children and youth who graduate from our ministry at East Maine to have an articulate, authentic Christian faith, biblical literacy, a commitment to service, discipleship through small groups, evangelistic mindset, and fellowship within a local church. Um, these are the things that we want to be cultivating. These are the things we want to be working on integrating really intentionally with our programming and in this position we now have the resources time-wise and people-wise um, to be able to invest in how that's going to happen um, and so yes it's a process thanks for your patience with that um, but that's a little bit of an overview about where that's going um, another piece that Bill had asked me to address um, is just also some of you heard that um, I will be starting the ordination process in ECO this year um, that's not an out of the blue thing. I actually have had a call to ministry since I was in my early 20s. I uh, went to seminary, got my degree, um, was actually in the ordination process in the United Methodist Church. Um, but then with some changes in my family dynamics, um, with the birth of my two children, postponed that process for a while and did some further discerning, had an opportunity to get back into ministry here. Um, and over the past few years have been able to experience that call afresh in some new ways and have really found a home here in the church and I'm looking forward to engaging that process um, over the next few years as well. And so moving into this process of kind of a broader ministry base, more opportunity to interact with a larger population of the church community is really exciting for me. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, again, it does reflect some of the work I did when I was working at a church in Massachusetts, 
um, where I had a role of assistant pastor with a focus on Christian education and spiritual formation. So it's exciting to come back and be doing this in a place where I really come to feel at home um, and really enjoy working here with the kids and students. I wanted to just give a minute for Jacqueline and Luke to come up and just introduce themselves to you, um, just to hear a really quick thing about them, their background, and uh, what they're about while they're here. Hello everyone, um, I'm Luke, and part of my ministry with children started uh, six years ago working at Seneca Hills. Um, I've been a counselor there for four years, as well as my time at Wheaton, where I led uh, small groups uh, and was a part of them for all four years of my time in college. Um, one thing that's always surprising to me, uh, particularly I noticed at Seneca Hill as a counselor, is um, at the beginning of the week we give them note cards to write down some uh, answers to questions we ask, and one of those is usually a question along the lines of, on a scale of one to 10, how sure are you you're gonna to go to heaven and, and why do you say that? Uh, and usually these answers range from five to seven and their answers include things like, uh, I'm nice to my siblings or I go to church and I read the Bible, which, which is far from the truth of, of the gospel. Uh, and so in engaging them in one-on-one, we ask them like, uh, what, is, what does it mean to be a Christian to you? Um, and so some of those reasons are why uh, I find it very important to be involved um, in youth ministry is because a lot of them uh, are missing the understanding of, of what the gospel truly is. And so part of my ministry uh, here will be making sure that in those small groups uh, that they understand uh, what it means to be a Christian and how Jesus shapes their identity. Um, and so that's what I'm excited to be doing here uh, and involved in. So. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Major. Um, I went to Westminster College. I got my degree in elementary education, so I'm certified K through six. While I was there, I also took a lot of um, classes that dealt with the Bible, like understanding the Bible, understanding religious experiences, and things of that nature. Uh, upon graduation, I did take some long-term substitute placements in some different school districts, searching for a job in teaching. In that time, I also met my husband, and we got married, and we started our family which, much like Melissa, made me kind of take a step back and say, you know, I want to be with my children. Um, so I put my career on hold, and then once my daughter was in first grade, I went back into substituting here at Grove City School District. We got involved in East Maine. We felt right at home the very first time we came. Everybody was super welcoming. Um, so I'm very, very excited. Um, when I first learned that Amy Biddle was not going to be children's director anymore, my first thought was, oh, I hope they find somebody really great because those are some really big shoes to fill and she's always super busy and she's great with the kids. And I just kept praying about it and just kept feeling that push. It wasn't even a tug, it was just kind of a push. Um, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. So I finally got brave and talked to Pastor Bill about it, who was, in my mind, I thought it was going to be, well, let's think about it, but instead it was, yes, we want you. Um, <laughs> so, long story short, I am very, very excited to be here. I absolutely adore children. I've taught Sunday school for the past three or four years. Um, I love their excitement. I love just the, the way that they embrace Jesus the way they embrace the Bible stories, the activities. Um, I just kind of love being around them. It's, it's just super, super fun. And I'm really excited about some of the fun things that we're going to be trying that are things that we have not done in the past with children and hopefully <coughs> outreaching into our community, bringing more families to East Maine and getting them plugged in. Um, because in the school district, when I am subbing, there are still a lot of kids who do not know anything about Jesus, and it just breaks my heart. So we want to reach them, we want to reach their families, and get them plugged in here. So. All right, Melissa, Jack, and Luke, thank you, thank you much. Um, and I want to have Eric say a few words for a minute, and then if you have some questions generally about staff, we'll, we'll take some of those. But uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you, tons. Well, Eric, there you are. Come on, and, and I think actually, uh, so you, 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 we met Eric in a lot of levels. Um, here, Sunday, you hear Sunday here at preach for some of his story, and also have to hear his heart for the gospel. 
But I have a picture, I think, that shows Eric's biggest oh, strength. Uh-oh. 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 No, really. No, it really is. It's, uh, let's see. There's Eric's biggest strength right there. <laughs> the McEwen girls. So Eric, just tell us a little bit about what your job is and, and how that contributes to helping make disciples. Okay. Well, good evening. Uh, so I'm still kind of trying to figure out my job. So just, um, yeah. Uh, my primary uh, focus here is on assimilation and on small group or adult uh, discipleship. Uh, also with uh, past, you know, general pastoral duties of preaching and visiting folks at the hospital and counseling and that type of thing. But uh, my main focus is assimilation and small group ministry, adult discipleship. So you do have a handout, and in a minute we're going to look at that, but I'm going to define assimilation real simply. Uh, we want people to come here for the first time and then eventually want them to come back and come back and come back and come back and be a part of our community, come to know Jesus Christ, and see their life transform. That's assimilation in a nutshell. Or, we can use this definition, the process used to encourage our first-time guests to continue coming back until they see and understand God's love, uh, come to a saving knowledge of Christ, and commit here to East Main as covenant partners. And so, one of the ways that we're doing that in assimilation, before I got here, uh, there was already kind of a shell set up uh, for this assimilation system. And if you will, can you look at the handout that I gave you? And I'm going to give you just, I'm going to try to explain a little bit of what we're trying to do. And once again, this is also a fluid kind of a thing. So we're seeing what works, what doesn't work. But mainly, we are trying to follow this type of model. So if you'll see, the first one is initial contact. And that's all the way up here, the blue one. And see, it says connect card, uh, children's check-in, event registration, welcome desk, greeter interaction. So, in other words, uh, we want to have contact with people, and then we want to get their name, address, email on a connect card the first time they come. And then eventually, now, we can do that in a service, we can do that like it says in an event, we could do that, uh, you know, Different, different places within the church on Sunday. Uh, if you just maybe meet somebody, you start talking to them. But eventually what we want to do, we want to take that information, and if you go down where the arrow points to input into church teams database, we want to get their information within our church teams database, which is a computer database that we use to track different things in the church. And we do that through staff members doing that. Volunteers um, have you know, passwords and they have login names, so they can do that for us. And also, you can check in, if, if you all know, you can check in electronically on your phone. And so that goes directly into the church team system so we can see if somebody for the first time uh, checks in via iPhone, we can see that from our end. And so after that initial, where we get people's information into the computer, uh, we want to, uh, usually it's either Bill and I, we're either going to email, uh, text them, give them a phone call, have that first initial contact with a pastor uh, to let them know that we're, you know, we're glad, we're grateful that they came, and we're looking forward uh, to them coming back, and if there's anything we can do, uh, we, you know, we're here to serve them or pray for them. And then after that contact, Uh, by a pastor, if they come back again, and after they've been identified again, that's when eventually we want to move them to what's called the follow-up team. And the follow-up team is uh, a group within the Connect team that specifically their job is to contact second and third time visitors to try and get them to come maybe to a small group, or even just get in a relationship with them, just kind of get to know them, uh, what, what they're about, what they're doing. And then after that, if that happens, our goal is is that they would come to a invite or, or, or meet the pastor lunch. Now, I don't know, have we had one of those, Bill? Nope. Okay. So there is one on the calendar, though, October 28th. So we, we do have that set up. And our goal is, is to get second, third time visitors and probably some others that have been here a while, too, that just recently came to come and meet the pastors, uh, to hear about the vision of the church to you know, ask questions about the church, whatever they would want to know, uh, that would be a next step in this assimilation process that we are trying to lead them into. And so 
at the Meet the Pastor, our eventual goal would be, you'll see the arrows uh, moving down to serve on a team, uh, check out a small group, sign up for an on-ramp class. So the different teams that we have within assimilation, uh, and, and I'm over uh, most of these, I believe. I know I'm, I'm over the greeters uh, who greet, and the bakers who bake, and the tidy up team who clean up after after church. Uh, food prep, they get that uh, you know cookies and cakes and all that good stuff that you all have in the morning. We get that out there to you. And then, of course, I just spoke about the follow-up team, those who are following up with second, third time visitors. And so these connect teams, we want to ask, I mean, even if they've been here two or three times, we'd say, hey, come be a greeter. Hey, would you like to bake? Because ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to be involved and connected in relationship with people here at the church with the ultimate goal of them becoming covenant members. Uh, maybe they don't even know Christ, you know, coming to know Christ, growing in their discipleship, following Jesus. And that connects to our whole goal, and that is to glorify God by making more disciples for Jesus Christ. So our goal in assimilation is to do that. And that, of course, is based off, like uh, Bill said, because Jesus kind of told us to, uh, the Great Commission, uh, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. So that is the underlying motivation of why we do what we do in the assimilation process. So... That's just a little bit about our assimilation process, um, how we're trying to get people connected here at East Main for the you know the first time visitors, second, third time. Um, so yeah, now small groups. So another aspect of my job is to oversee uh, small group ministries. And so basically, to give you a little overview of what I've been doing thus far with small groups, is I coordinate with the group leaders on a number of fronts. Uh, so classroom study material, if they have any questions or if they want maybe my advice on that, which a lot of them don't, but <laughs> if they do, um, I'm here and I'll try to give them that advice on that. Um, event planning, let's say just like what happened with uh, this this Sunday with the brunch, um, Andy's class preparing uh, you know meals for the college students. So I'm involved with that, getting uh, checks back to people after they've paid at the county market or whatever, um, making sure that we have the room, uh, making sure the time's right, so things of that nature uh, with the small groups. And once again, I oversee the budget for the small groups to make sure that we're spending the money that we have and we're not spending the money that we don't have. And uh, you know, sh we, we also are strategizing on how to draw new members into these groups. And, one way that Bill and I have uh, kind of concocted, if you will, um, on how to try to do this is we're trying to track uh, through attendance, through who's coming to the groups, not to see who's the best small group and who's knocking it out with 20 members every week or anything like that, but we want to identify who is coming into the groups so then we can look at who's not coming into the groups and then start asking questions like, why aren't they coming? and strategize with the staff, strategize and draw them in to a small group. So that's the reason why, if you're, if you're a uh, small group leader, why you've had an email saying, hey, could you please get the attendance? It's not like we're the, uh, we're like the Gestapo, we're trying to find out what's going on in your classes or you know, trying to be the NSA or nothing like that. We just want to strategize by looking at who is coming, who's not, and eventually helping them become more of a disciple of Jesus. Um, so yeah, overseeing and making sure the leaders have everything they need, um, and also just encouraging the congregation to consider the importance of small groups, uh, community, small communities. You know, the, the early church really was a network of small, small communities, small churches, and the church spread like wildfire um, in the first and second centuries like that. So getting the congregation to understand that church is great on Sunday. We need to come to church. It's great to collectively meet, get together, but you cannot get certain things uh, at church that you can in those small groups. You, don't, you can't really get accountability in a huge group. Um, you can't really be in a relationship with people on a Sunday morning. Uh, you can't really get too deep in your relationship with them. And so what the small groups do is they give folks an opportunity to go into a smaller group, uh, you know, get accountability, um, and be able to be vulnerable 
and maybe really talk about stuff that they wouldn't normally talk about on a Sunday. And so that's ultimately um, one of our goals for the small group ministry. And that kind of sums up what I'm doing with those uh, two things right now. Like I said, it could change. Um, we can see something's not working and we can strategize and, and we can try to do something different. But uh, the shell that we have right now, we like. And at this point, it's kind of like, let's see what works. How can we tweak this? You know, how can we make this work better so people can, you know, become disciples of Jesus and we can glorify God through that. So. Eric, thank you. Who are the ladies on the screen? Let me put this? Up here. Oh, 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 that's nobody. That's nobody. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they're somewhere. Maybe I'll find them. Oh, oh. Yeah, who are they? So this is my wife, Kate. We've been married for seven years. This is our first child, Grace. And she's three years old. And this is our little... Uh, she just turned a year old today, actually. Today's her, her one-year birthday. And so Hannah, Grace, and Kate. And, uh, yeah, they are... Um, they're awesome. That's all I can say. <laughs> Love them to death. Eric, thank you much. And um, you know, one thing that, that, that really excited us about about Eric and uh, when we started getting to meet him is that you know when he's described, particularly the simulation, he's talking about you know how do we help people who are already walked in the door to connect more with Jesus and with us. But and that's that's part of what we're called to do because we have we have people to visit all the time. However. One of Eric's real passions, and I, I think you're catching this, is just is, is people outside the church. And Eric can talk about Jesus with anybody, and he's 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 just very very naturally gifted with that. And that's something very exciting to us as well. That um, uh, you know, it's not just it, it's not just assimilation of people who are walking in the door, but helping helping bring Jesus to people who won't ever walk in the door. And, and again, Eric, I think will really be helpful to us in that. General questions or specific questions you might have about our staffing. About this, and we've got to meet a couple of folks and see a little of what we're doing. Questions? This is Foka. Will you define on ramp class specifically? Yeah, um, on ramp class. These are, are for people who are not yet involved, like plugged into a small group type ministry. It's what's a what's a good first step? Uh, what's a you know? For example, the becomers class is not a good on ramp class. For somebody who doesn't know anybody here and is just kind of getting their feet wet. Because you're a group of people who are already well established with each other in relationship. Uh, your class has been going for a long time. Yeah. A good example of an on ramp class would be, say, the Financial Peace University that meets tomorrow night or two nights from now. You know, it's a felt need that people in the community may, may kind of feel a little nervous about church. Um, another good example of an on ramp class would be some of the classes that are looking at like the same scriptures that are being talked about Sunday morning. Because Again, it doesn't assume that you have much background with the class and the people and the material. It's like, oh, okay, I hear about that Sunday. They're going to talk about it over here. Um, so it's ways, you know, an easy, an easy on road to, to, to further life of the church. Yep. Good question, especially about staff things. Ruth? I noticed that Luke is working with the seventh, eighth grade, and high school times. Are we going to forget the girls? <laughs> no, we, there, there are small group leaders for. For yeah, Melissa has, has recruited small group leaders for uh, for a whole bunch of folks, and not not just Luke. Yeah, those are the ones he's focusing in on personally. And but. also, uh, we have a uh, apparently a broader focus with college students. Is that under anyone's particular ministry? No, there there was a uh, this past summer a group got together that was especially interested in in college student ministries, and so. Um, no, there's not a there's not a, a, an additional focus on that. We have a, still a Sunday school group that meets with college students. Uh, there's some people who are specifically committed to trying to reach out to students who visit with us. Um, but no, there's not not like a particular core college ministry. In fact, and we've we've long said that that we think one of our our gifts to college students is to be a church that doesn't just focus on them, but seeks to integrate them in the life of the church. Uh, some students don't want that, they, but some students do. They want to meet, you know, grandmas and grandpas and little kids and, and be a part of that, you know, weekends. So that, that's, those are the students that we're more appealing to. Any questions about staff stuff? Jim? Yeah, could we get, maybe this is an appropriate question, but I was wondering if we could get a 
progress report on how JAM is working out with the new leadership and the new structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we really want to hold off on that for a bit, Jim. Okay. You no, know, we just wanted to hold off because, you know, at, at this point, we're still week to week trying to work out bugs yeah, from it. That's <laughs> and, uh, um, so we need to let Yeah, we, we really want to let like a couple months go by. But Melissa, any comments you want to make about that? change that's, that's less obvious than the changes in staff that you've seen. And that is just um, a changing role for, for elders. Um, and, and again, how do, we, how do we most effectively organize leadership to fulfill our mission? Um, one of the things that was our consulting team uh, prescribed for us was that we would reduce the size of our session and kind of change the scope of our, our session. Um, and, and it really changed just kind of the role of elders in accordance with uh, what's called the accountable leadership model that our, our elders have, have been reading about and discussing, and I think for the most part have been embracing. Um, and, and last time we had a gathering like this at the end of last May, one of the things I told you then was that this fall we would be coming to you as a congregation uh, for a, a vote to change our bylaws to do this. Well, guess what? We're not doing that, at least not this fall. We're not doing that. Um, and we're not doing that this fall because while we did get a, a, a commissioned a team of a couple of elders along with our director of operations, Steve, to get together to try to figure out a way uh, to effectively do this, um, there really wasn't something that as yet we've come up with that was satisfactory to the session to present to the congregation. 
in that vein. And so uh, until, until we're able to do that though, uh, we did believe that this, this accountable leadership model is something we want to, to try to embrace. And so we've come up with a transition plan uh, for, for how we're going to be, be doing that um, until such a time as we can kind of codify this more with our, our bylaws. And uh, here, here in a nutshell is what the plan is. Um, beginning with our, our next election of, of, of elders, which is going to be you know, in the fall, which we're going to do the way that we've typically done, we're going to seek to, to have uh, three classes of five elders each, okay? But two very different kinds of elders with two very different roles. They're even going to meet in different times because they're doing uh, very different things. Um, one kind of elder is going to be a mission and vision elders, ideally about five to seven of these, and their main role is keeping us on track with their mission, okay? And then ministry program elders, um, who again, are de facto volunteer staff who lead specific ministries. And, and something I believe I told you last time with this is, in, in, in my experience, a long time now of, of being with sessions, uh, almost every session I've been a part of, you have two kinds of people. You have some elders who, they really want to do that, that forward thing. They want to say, you know, what's our mission? What's our vision? How are we doing with this? They're always pressing those kind of questions. And meanwhile, there's a whole other group that are like rolling their eyes when they talk about this stuff because they just want to do stuff. They want to lead ministries. They want to get some, some ministry stuff done. And so really a lot of what this is about is sort of a recognition of that difference and, um, and letting elders sort of, sort of do, do their thing that way. Um, mission vision elders, here more specifically, is what, what we envision that group doing. A lot of what they do, they, they hold me accountable. But not accountable like in terms of, well, Bill, how many people did you visit this month? Um, how many meetings did you go to? Uh, how much time did you spend in sermons? Not, not for that stuff like that, but accountable for results. And missional kind of results. Results in terms of, okay, we're supposed to be making new disciples. Are we making new disciples? Are we raising up new leaders who can help us make disciples? Um, are we, what about you know, participation, attendance, and things that we're doing that are supposed to help make disciples? Um, how about finances? Because that's another resource for making disciples. How are we doing in those areas? Again, this group holds me accountable for things like that. Also, this group is going to meet regularly with different ministries of the church to encourage and resource and permission. Now, this means that um, every meeting, two or three different groups will meet with this, this bunch from the church. They could be as small as, as a, an individual Sunday school class or Bible study, and then maybe the other one would be something like the community dinner ministry group. Okay? And, and basically, we get together with that group and ask questions. Hey, what is your ministry? How is it going? How, how does your ministry contribute, or, or how could it contribute more to our overall mission of reaching out and making more disciples for Jesus? What resources do you need? How can we pray for you? And I think the idea is that if, if this group is, is meeting with two or three different ministries like that each time, and is meeting, say, six or eight times a year, that over time, this group really does get its finger on the pulse of what's going on in our ministry here this week, and also is progressively encouraging all of our ministries to be a part of our mission of reaching out and making new disciples. And then also, each time we get together, we need to read and study. Um, and, and discuss uh, various issues related to our mission, especially areas we're weak in. For example, evangelism. One of the things this year, we're going to read something together and talk about some more about evangelism together and how we can filter that into the church. Also, this whole assimilation thing that Eric was talking about, something that we've never been super intentional about as a church. And maybe that would be one that we could, could read up on as well. Um, so anyway, you might think, well, well, doesn't session do that now? Don't they do this stuff already? Well, yeah, we sort of do. Um, but because every time we get together as a session, we have a lot of just kind of urgent things coming at us all the time from here, there, and hither, and yon, we don't get to do that super intentionally, super well, with a good focus to it. Um, and I think what can free us up now to focus on those things is knowing that there's another group of elders that is leading the different ministries that has the authority to make decisions to lead different ministries. And that's what we're calling these ministry program elders. And 
you know, at any given time, uh, what what roles those program elders would have and what ministries they focus on may may differ. But here's kind of where we see the needs now. First of all, we need three of these elders for property and finance. Those are your trustees. Why do we need three to do that? Because our bylaws say we do. <laughs> we need three ruling elders to be trustees. So for now, that's that's how we're going to do that. Um, the trustees will basically be the, be the ministry program elders. Um, and also, you know, one each in, in these, these other areas uh, that you see here. Um, well, again, that's it. In, in the back also, the sheet next to the staff, there's a summary of, of what we need. It's a little bit misleading there because um, when it says what, what we need new elders for, because uh, some people who are going to continue to be ruling elders who are on the board now are going to have some of those roles too. That's just giving you some idea of, um, of some of our, our leadership needs there. Again, I'm not quite sure, just at this point, you know, questions, comments, objections about, about this, this kind of new model of how we're going. Sue. Okay. I have a question in relationship to the ministry program elders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Historically, not recently, historically when you're an elder, you would be a chairperson of the committee, or yep. two of you would be on the committee, mm -hmm. okay? Now, looking at this, am I correct in the assumption, I hate to use the word, that maybe those committees no longer now exist? Does the mission committee, does Christian Ed do it? Does hospi hospitality, do those committees <coughs> continue to exist? and the elders slide in there, or are they now defunct and this replaces it? Yeah, well, again, do we have a worship committee? Yeah, we do. Um, we have will a mission we? committee, right? Um, excuse me, yep. but will we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, basically these elders would, would sort of be like committee chairs. Okay. They would be sort of the, the, the chairs of those committees. In other words, we want somebody who is a ruling elder who really has a passion for mission. To, to, to be somebody who's there. You know, Karen was that for, for a while when you were, were on the board. Um, then for a long season, like Karen's not on the board now, but she, she still chairs the mission committee. But we, we think mission is something that's pretty significant in our church and needs that kind of oomph to it. Needs somebody who is a ruling elder who is a part of that, part of the leadership of that. Um, likewise with all of these areas. And, and yeah, they'll have a team of people around them. Um, we envision this group of people meeting together either quarterly or about every other month, but the assumption is that they are meeting with teams in those ministry areas, like, like committees would be. Mm -hmm. um, that they're bringing alongside others and making decisions about worship, about assimilation, about disciples of adults. And again, obviously, a lot of these folks are working with one of our paid staff members as well. Um, but they also have real authority to make decisions in those areas. Uh, they have a budget. They don't have to come to the full session and get approval to do those things. They can actually make those decisions and lead them. Whereas the other group is, is trusting them to do that, commissioning them to do that, being glad that they're doing that. But standing, standing committees that are doing things related to the things you see there do not disappear. But rather the elder goes in that direction. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they don't disappear, but they might take new, new forms. I mean, for example, a good one, a good example that would be Christian Ed. You know, Right there, you see two of them that really are right Christian ed, right? I, I think it makes better sense to have a discipleship of adults group and a discipleship of children and youth group. And, and they're kind of, because they, they have different passions, different interests, and somewhat different focuses. So instead of a Christian ed committee, you have a, an adult discipleship team that works with Eric, that works with one of the ruling elders there, and, and they do their thing with that. You have you know, an elder, ruling elder, working with children and youth who's working with, with Luke and Melissa, and Jacqueline, um, and maybe some others there as well. So the, the, what, what would have been the committees might take different kind of shape and form than they have in the past, but I think that's always been true anyway. Committees kind of rise and fall according to the needs. Karen? So are we going to these two types of elders in January? Yep. Yep. Ron? How often will the full session meet? You say like the uh, mission and vision elders will we meet a couple times a quarter. In the ministry program, the elders will meet possibly a couple times a quarter. How about the full session? They'll never meet? Nope. 
Okay. There's, there's nothing that requires full session approval. You're, you're going to try and get away from that. So there's nothing that requires full session approval. What we're hoping to do is, is eventually go to, yeah, to go to a model that, that looks like this transitional model. And probably, probably these folks, whether they'll still be the elders or we'll call them ministry program staff is what they're really, their function is. Um, but no, the, our, our envisioning is not that this, the, the two groups don't need to meet together to make decisions. Tammy? It sounds like you can't wrap up a way for us to vote to diminish the elder number in a way that would pass our congregation. And so therefore, we're sort of just like, well, we're going to make you over here and make you over here, especially if they're not all meeting together. Yeah, actually, the, 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 the bigger issue, Tammy, I think, with getting this codified bylaws for you to vote on mm -hmm. is figuring out the difference between the church as a corporation mm -hmm. versus the church as, as the, the body of Christ, the fellowship here. It's, it's more that, that technical issue. It's not that we're trying to hide things. In fact, I wouldn't say this all to you now if we're trying to hide things. It's more, again, it's trying to get that, um, that that's I think, and, and maybe Dave and, or Steve could speak a little bit to that about what the real staff of here is. Yeah, we, we, we basically, it was we looked at this, and Dave, if this is an accurate jump in, but I think the question that came up really was more of a legal issue. As we looked at the bylaws, the whole issue that Bill just talked about, we didn't feel that we were capable of looking at that and making a decision that we felt comfortable with from a, a legal standpoint, that there was a little more complication um, in changing the bylaws than just changing the number of elders that we had. So um, I think that at that point, that's when we kind of backed away from that idea, or at least that was part of the impetus to back away from that idea, um, that, that there were some issues that went deeper and beyond what we were originally addressing. Well, and I can appreciate that, but if the elder board is never meeting together, it doesn't seem like there's much of an elder board. And so it seems like we're not going to legally address those issues because they're complicated, but we're going to just sort of do it anyway. I, I would say that we're not going to address them. I think we just felt we didn't have time to address okay. them to bring it to the congregation this this early. Um, I think, and, and, and I'm pretty sure Dave, we were on the same page about, ultimately we do think the bylaws should be changed. I think what you have to have is some period of transition to figure out what you're going to do. So if you jump in it with a bylaws change before you've even tried something out, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're going to yeah. request the congregation to do, and it may not work. Mm -hmm. So what the impetus is is to change the accountable leadership model, right, with what is laid out here. See how it flashes out, and still keep in contact or keep the uh, legal basis of the church, you know, untouched. So there needs to be a time to work this out. So that's the transition plan, I think. The wisdom of that uh, gives you time to, so maybe this doesn't work out so well. Maybe we need you know, some other small tweak to it. The, ori the original idea, too, was to actually s just suspend the bylaws, right. not right. to eliminate them, but just to suspend them. Hold them in abeyance. To, to give us that flexibility that Dave's talking about mm -hmm. to you know, explore other options. So the bylaws weren't going to be thrown out per se, but we, we needed to temporarily suspend them to be able to, to to try some of these other things related to the model of leadership we we're looking at. Right. And I can understand that. I just would be probably more comfortable with the whole suspension or the wait and see, try it out, if I knew that the two hands of the elders were talking to each other at some point. That's a, that's the question I have. It sounds like we're going to have two groups of elders. Mm -hmm. Is there one small group that does the leading and coordinating? They do a lot of the work, but this one group is aware of everything that's going on. It's not the elders anymore. How, how do we coordinate and lead? The, the mission and vision elders are, are charged to know what's going on broadly in the church. That's one reason why they meet with a lot of different groups all the time. Okay, so they'll and be the coordinating committee. They'll be the coordinating group, but but also that we're counting on people is that that we're really we're we're entrusting and empowering staff people to lead, including these people are like staff people to lead. But there's accountability. There's a lot of accountability. 
to. These people, we're they, trusting they, them to leave. Do they report up to one group, or they they're a standalone by themselves? I, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm used to having one committee that doesn't do all the work, but they are the one central place that every funnels into and coordinates everything. So you're saying that's the, that's one of these. The, the mission groups. and vision group is, is responsible okay. to coordinate everything, make sure everything's lined up with, okay. with what our mission is. All right. Yeah. It's almost more like a mindset change than it is a structural change, right? I mean, the mindset is, is are things being done, are people being held accountable, is the mission of the church being done? Not so much of the, what, the physical forum of 15 elders meeting together. Those functions are still happening, it's just in a different manner. Is that a, Steve? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good good way to say it. And I think I think the other the other big change from the mindset standpoint is that there there is a group that, that is going to set parameters, and I think those parameters are parameters are established to give uh, the staff appropriate guidance and certain limitations. You've got to operate within these limitations. What's really changing is I think we're moving from a model where a larger group or committees also dealt with all the how-tos, the everyday things in the church. And frankly, that's inefficient and not very effective. And so what we're doing is we're saying, we're gonna turn the how-tos over really to the staff. The staff, the staff is gonna do the how-tos. We, we're not overly concerned. As long as you stay within these parameters that we've set for you, we're not overly concerned. We're gonna we're gonna hold you accountable to, for things. There's a greater degree of accountability, uh, but it's it's gonna be a different way of operating. And, and again, it's a mindset change I think for a church like ours, where where we're moving to a staff-led church, but there's a much greater degree of accountability. And again, these you want to call them fences are kind of set for people, and then you op they operate within those within those fences. A concrete example would be, you know, one of those fences is your budget, right? So, so there's a budget that, that basically that, that, not this group, but the well, first group, the Mission and Vision Group, has the overall church budget. But within that, um, you know, in the area, say, of, of adult discipleship, there's this budget. And, and between Eric and his team of people, which includes one of the ruling elders is there, they get to spend that budget. They don't have to come back to the group and say, can we do this or can we not do this? What about this idea? They don't do that. They just get to do it. And, and by the way, and this group doesn't monkey with them. They don't say, well, why did you spend it in that instead of this? You know, we, we, we used to always use this curriculum. And you know, they can tell you if you want to know, but it's not like they have to seek approval to, within that parameter that is their budget to do something. We're really freeing these people up, the, the, the program people, to actually lead. Ron? I have a question. Um, Past, we always had administration committee, mm -hmm. and they did the hiring pretty much. You know, it took full session approval generally to hire someone at the recommendation of the administration committee. Who I don't see administration committee on here. Right. Um, who will do that? Will that be the Will that be the four vision elders? Will that be the director? It depends on who it is. Uh, in many cases, it's director of operations. Uh, for example, we've had a couple of hires, and, and by it's not director of operations acting by him or herself, but for example, um, one of our most recent hires, we had to hire a, a part-time custodian. And so what we decided was, uh, director of operations and me really, decided, hmm, the people they have to work most closely with are Dan Bishop and Stacy Tubbs. So we're gonna figure out how to get a pool of people, and we're gonna let Dan and Stacy look at them, and we'll sit in and, and listen in, and, and basically, we're strongly oriented to, to hire who they want. Um, with the nursery coordinator, which is one we're, we're looking at right now, um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a sitting administrative committee who they're experts now at, at custodians, now they're experts at nurseries, they're experts at assistant pastors. No, they're not. Uh, we think the experts with, with the nursery group is going to be people like Jacqueline, uh, who does a children's ministry, Melissa, and maybe a mom or two. And so we get a group like that together to do that one. Bill, and I would add to that that we're also, there are things though that we are asking um, elders to be involved in or other, mm -hmm. other key um, people in the church that, that may have a specific gift or talent or interest in an area. 
So there, there are some circumstances that, uh, you know, for instance, we're, we're working, I'm working with um, a couple of the trustees on some things right now that, that it's not just the director of operations and Bill doing things, but we're involving other, other leaders in the church, whether it's from the trustees or from session, um, to, to help out with certain things that we feel go beyond the scope of what we're able to do or that what we're comfortable doing without involving those other people. But presumably at the pastoral level, the be a pastor nominating committee. Should, heaven forbid, this position become vacant, then it wouldn't be just the mission and vision elders, it would be the nominating mm -hmm. committee from the congregation. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sue? Okay, going to these list of staff members, I'm a little confused about our director of operations who now lives in a different state. Uh, he's probably as confused as you are. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are, we are looking. I swear you're hired. I swear <laughs> they said goodbye. Not that, uh, that's not yeah, that we, negative We would have offered to double his salary. He wouldn't come back. <laughs> that was, that was and as I understand, his salary is just about zero. <laughs> well, for the next one, it's going to be a little more than that. But uh, I, I am, by the way, I am willing to stay until the cow comes home to, to answer, you know, other kind of questions. But I, I do want to, I want to wrap this up together uh, for now. If I can, I want to just point us to a passage of scripture here in a sec. If I can get it. Oh, well, I can't get it. Can I, um, can I just ask a real quick question? When you vote on the elders, coming elders, will we know whether they are a mission or a ministry already? We're going to try to recruit them that way, so yeah, okay. yeah, we can certainly so say it's not, so. It's not somebody that you, there's like a group of elders and you assign them? No, no, in fact, I think this is going to make it more clear for those we approach to be elders what we're asking you to do. Um, you know, especially, it, it helps avoid the, the, the frustrations and fears of, of uh, oh my goodness, I really, I like doing like trustee stuff, but I do not want to sit and read some book and talk about whatever, <laughs> no. Um, well, they don't have to do that. We're, we're recruiting them to be a, a property finance elder trustee. So or recruit. Like Becky Ryder worship, that, yep. that, that's how it will be listed when we go through it. I hope so. Mostly, or at least Becky Ryder ministry program. At least that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice One more question. I thought the trustees were not necessarily elders presently. That's true. And there still will be some who are. Yeah. Yep. How many trustees will there be then? Six. Three yep. three. Yep. Yeah, I, I just, as we wrap this up, um, I, I'm aware, you know, you, you might, uh, uh, you, you come to this and you came with kind of some questions, concerns about our staff or about, you know, where we're going in leadership, and maybe you leave with even more of them. Um, and uh, I do hope, though, that, that part of what tonight has been about for you is it's at least clarified more for you what we're doing and why in terms of staff. It's at least I'll clarify that whether or not you agree with it, but there's still some questions about it. And that's, that's all, all fine, and we can keep on, on raising those questions. I want to finish, though, with, with just back where we started, a brief word about, you know, what, what can all of us be about uh, to help us in our mission of of honoring God by making more disciples for Jesus. And you know, sometimes like, we think about that, we think, about, okay, making more disciples, what's that mean for us here? Well, what that means is we come to church and, and we kind of get you know, encouraged and equipped to leave the doors and talk about Jesus with people we know who don't go to church by ourselves, right? That we, we have our individual, and that's part of it. That's certainly part of, of how a church makes disciples. That's, you know, we help inspire Pete Raymond, so Pete, you know, goes to wherever Pete goes and shares something, you know, he, he was thinking about Sunday morning with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. That, that, that does happen. That's part of it. Frankly, that's a part of it that most people find really scary or uncomfortable they feel guilty about, they feel inept about, okay? But I also think there's another really, really significant way that churches together contribute to making disciples. And that has to do with, you know, our life together and what that life looks like. And again, I, I thought about these, these lines of scripture here. Um, you know, what Jesus said, you know, how, how does he say people will know for his disciples? You know, if we have great answers to all their questions about who God is and you know, why he did this and did No, um, it's, it's something about the quality of your life with one another. And so issues like, um, 
You know, how, how are we with each other when somebody in our family dies or gets in really serious trouble? Or how do we celebrate with each other, right? Or, or how do we deal with, with people in our congregation who don't think like, like we do in terms of like politics or how to raise your kids or, or uh, how you should spend money, you know? Um, how do we deal with it when we don't get our way? Or when we do get our way, but the person next to us isn't getting their way, and they're kind of upset about that. Um, you know, and, and what do we do with those people? That they're, not, they're not doing anything wrong or bad, but we just find them kind of annoying. You know? Uh, you know, how as a church do we, do we handle uh, that kind of thing? What's our church look like in, in the way we relate to each other and those things? Because I think for good or for ill, um, how we relate to each other in those kind of ways says a lot about, about what we profess to believe about the gospel. Um, it does. And uh, the good news, though, is that to, to, to be a, an effective and faithful witness in this area doesn't take any special talent or skill or, or biblical knowledge, right? Um, it doesn't take any of that. And I guess what got me thinking about this in the first place was just a statement that uh, I read, and I'll just leave you with this. A statement I read um, by Rick Warren last week. And uh, here's the, the first part of it. I'll give you the first part, which is his, his question. Is what are you doing personally to make your church family more warm and loving? And then it goes on this way. It says, what are you doing personally to make your church family more warm and loving? There are many people in your community who are looking for love and a place to belong. The truth is, everyone needs and wants to be loved. And when people find a church where members genuinely love and care for each other, you would have to lock the doors to keep them away. And so again, you know, what, what are you doing personally to make your church family more warm and loving? That, that's going to have a lot to do uh, with how we do at, um, at making disciples. Um, and maybe I, I, I'll just I'll close some prayer for now, and again, I'll stay for people who want to talk about things, but maybe that's a kind of a focus we can all kind of be thinking about as we, as we pray here. Let's, let's pray. Praise God, thank you for, again, this time together. And, um, but we also thank you that, that being a part of making disciples does not require us to be especially gifted or, or evangelistic in nature. But Lord, part of it is simply how it is that we relate to one another in ways that a watching world can see and be drawn to. And so I do ask that for myself and for each of us, you would speak to us about that, of what each of us can be doing personally to help our fellowship to be a more warm and loving fellowship. And we pray, oh God, that as, uh, as that begins to take place more and more and more, Lord, that uh, not only would we ourselves be encouraged and built up in Christ, but the people around us would see, would notice, and we'd be drawn to you because of what they see. Lord, go with us as we go forth tonight uh, into the most significant ministries you give us with neighbors and families and and the people around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.